Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. So what we see here is Paul knowing that a truly righteous man or a righteous woman will do the right thing. So he writes as if he expects him to do the right thing because he knows however immature or carnal or selfish or self-centered they might be, God was going to transform them, and he's a part of that process. Now... In today's broadcast, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, Signs of a Fruitful Fellowship. We are concluding the book of 1 Corinthians as we look at the final chapter, chapter 16. Herein, Paul is closing things up by discussing collections for the saints, his personal plans, his final exhortations, and some greetings with a solemn farewell. So, let's listen in. This last chapter here in the book of 1 Corinthians turns out to be much more encouraging than you might realize at first reading. And here's why. Many of you have studied with us from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 16. Some of you have more recently joined us. Perhaps some of you are here for the first time today. You need to know that Paul wrote this letter to a very frustrated fellowship. It was a fellowship filled with carnal Christians, immature, confused Christians. And wherever you have immaturity and carnality, well, you're going to have some sin. Now, the upside to that is they were actually winning the loss. Because if you have a fellowship where there are, no, there are no immature people, no carnal people, well, then you have a fellowship of, well, everybody knows the Lord. It's, you know, we three or we four and no more. And so you want a situation where people are coming in and coming to the Lord. But you need to factor in that that's going to be a little bit of a, a conflict. Now, there's nothing wrong with being immature in the Lord if you're immature as a Christian, if you've just come to know the Lord. But if you're five years old in the Lord and you're still immature in the Lord, that's a real problem. So here's what Paul's going to do. He's going to talk to them and, and share with them as if he expects them to do the right thing. So knowing their immaturity, knowing their carnality, I can't help but ask, what would it cause him to expect them to do the right thing? How could he trust them knowing all he knew about them? And here's the interesting thing. Paul didn't trust them. He, he wasn't hoping in them. Or it, it wasn't him trusting them. It was him trusting the one, well, who had transformed him, who had saved him. You see, Paul knew someone who can take a life that's either religious or completely oblivious and turn it into a life that's faithful and fruitful for him. Paul had that personal experience. So what we see here is Paul knowing that a truly righteous man or a righteous woman will do the right thing. So he writes as if he expects him to do the right thing because he knows however immature or carnal or selfish or self-centered they might be, God was going to transform them and he's a part of that process. Now, Concerning the collection for the saints, we read, chapter 16, verse 1, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me couple of things, and then we're going to get some background on exactly what it is Paul's dealing with as he begins his conclusion. When he mentions that he'd given orders, it's not exactly what it sounds like. He had prearranged and organized, well, the transfer of some funds to a very needy church. Now he's saying, hey, I want you to participate in this whole thing. The background important to us today, the Jerusalem church was suffering great persecution, and they were also greatly impoverished. The persecution was primarily at the hands of the Romans, but not entirely. The impoverishment came about because many, well, most of the people living in Jerusalem who weren't Romans or weren't Greek, well, they were Jews. And when a Jew came to Christ, from heaven's perspective, he was, she was, you would be a completed Jew. In other words, a Jew that finds the Messiah. 
is called a completed Jew. Why? Because that, that, that's the whole point of completion. The religious upbringing, the feasts, the festivals, the, the ceremonies, the, the, the sacrifices, they were all meant to point to Jesus. So you come to Jesus, now you're complete in him. True for Gentile, by the way, as well. Complete in him. Well, here's the problem. If you were Jewish in that age, well, and, and you came to Christ, well, your family was, for the most part, rejecting you. And so you had people, and, and everyone worked with dad. Every family worked together. If their dad was a fisherman, you were a fisherman. If dad was a carpenter, you were a carpenter. You didn't wait till you got out of college and try to figure out what you wanted to do with your life. No, when you were 12 years old, you went from being a child to a man. They didn't even have this adolescent stage that so many are kind of caught up in, and it's moving all the way from like now like 14 to 30 or something. But, but I don't know, one of these days I'll find my way and figure out who I am. But, but you were a child or you were a man. And at 12 years old, you became a man. You worked and you supplied and, and, and you were a part of the family structure. Well, here's the deal. These kids were growing up. They come to know the Lord and then they're disowned by their parents. Well, there's no visible means of support. Their uncle won't hire them. Their brother won't hire them. Their dad won't provide for them. So they went from having everything to having Jesus but nothing else. The other problem was many in the Jerusalem church, and this is true throughout the, the early church, throughout the Roman Empire, well, they were slaves. A slave was an owned person, so a slave didn't own anything. So the Jerusalem church not only suffering great persecution, but they were seriously impoverished. They did their best to take care of one another. They were meeting regularly, all of them meeting daily to, to get into the word of God, the apostles' doctrine. They fellowshiped spent time with one another. They, they were in prayer and, and they broke bread together and they gave and took care of each other. And, and the Lord added daily to the church those who should be saved. It was a wonderful model, but, but it had its problems. And the problem was they were running out of assets. They were running out of funds. So Paul sees an opportunity. He speaks to the Gentile churches, this church, at Corinth, those in Ephesus and, and Colossae and other areas. And he says, listen, let's take up a collection. Let's take that money down to Jerusalem and let those guys know that, that we care for them, that, that we're aware of the suffering they're going through, that we want to take care and be a part of the solution to their suffering. Well, I think it's an excellent model for us. And, and, and as we see this, there's the background historically. Now what Paul deals with is, well, how is all this going to take place? And in the first two verses, he gives us the when, the who, the what, the how, and the why of giving. It's a brief outline, and we're going to cover it briefly. When we get into 2 Corinthians, which we'll study next, we'll see in chapters 8 and 9, he'll deal in, in some detail in this area. But for today, we're just going to glean from both principles and good examples that we can follow. Well, first thing he mentions is this collection for the saints. He mentions in verse 3, the last word, Jerusalem, so that helps you put that together. And then he says, the first day of the week, verse 2, chapter 16, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. The win of all this first day of the week. And you need to know that the Jews celebrated and, and ministered on the Sabbath. It was the seventh day. It is the seventh day. It will always be the seventh day. And so prior to the law, God rested on the seventh day. He set it aside as the Sabbath under the law, and Israel was and is under the law. He gave them the seventh day to rest. It was a day of reflection, a day of fellowship with their families. It was a day of worship. There were all sorts of restrictions and rules and regulations. You couldn't walk any further than a certain distance. You couldn't light a fire. You couldn't work. Why? God wanted men to rest. He wanted families to be together. And so he says, work six days, but rest on the Sabbath. Now, the early church in Jerusalem, most of them still honored the Sabbath and celebrated it. Why? That was their cultural upbringing. They'd spent their entire lives worshiping and celebrating and doing that. But now they added a celebration and that was, well, Sunday. It's the first day of the week. It is the day of resurrection. And in the Gentile churches, from day one, it was always about the first day of the week. Now, it is important to note that God isn't hung up, and we shouldn't be hung up on, on seventh day. No, we need to be seven-day Christians, not seventh-day Christians. It's not about a Sabbath or the Sabbath. It's about 
worshiping, serving, fellowshipping every single day. But we've always set the church, that is, Sunday aside as a special day. That's why most of us are here today. We know that this is a day we can come together to worship corporately, to study corporately, to get our marching orders, as it were, from the Lord so we can go back out throughout this next week and better represent our Lord. So that's what he's talking about here. He knew they would come together on the first day of the week. And he says, when you come together, well, here's what we want to see happen. He deals with the who. That's the second issue. Uh, And it's each one. I already mentioned in the Jerusalem church that they all continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now he says, make sure you're adding to that, at least here to the the, uh, Corinthian church. He says, make sure you're adding to that, setting something aside. So each one was to contribute. Now the law in Israel was under the law. We're sort of seeing a contrast here. The law required tithes and offerings, but there was also just gifts. The gifts weren't mandatory. They were just that. They were gifts. But we're not under the law. We're under grace. And and some are like, well, then it's not really an issue. Well, I've noticed, and I think you would see the same thing if you really looked at Jesus' teaching regarding being under the law or under grace. Under grace, it's a higher standard, not a lower one. Under the law, it was 10% to God. Under grace, it's 100% for God. Why? Everything I have comes from him. And so what he's saying is, I want you to set something aside. I want you to do it regularly, systematically, every single resurrection day, every single Sunday. Set something aside. Now, this is actually a biblical principle, not just a good example. We're told that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. We're told that if a man doesn't supply for his own family, he's worse than an infidel. He's denied the faith. So we're supposed to work and provide for our families. Then we're supposed to make sure that we're good stewards of the money so we can meet the needs of our extended family. And beyond that, that we can meet whatever needs might come to our attention. We're to have an excess And we're to use that excess as God leads us to bless people who are more in need than we are. Well, that's the when, that's the Sabbath, and that's the who. So, so again, all of them would be participating in this. And then there's the what and the how. The what, of course, it's a gift. The how, well, all giving was and is to be in proportion to God's blessing and God's provision. This should be a no-brainer. We can't give what we don't have. So as God blesses and prospers us, then we should have more. I do think you're aware that in our culture, the more people make, the more in debt they are. Not just that you have a bigger house, so your mortgage is higher, or you drive a newer or nicer car, so your car payment's higher and your insurance is higher. But the proportion of debt that people have, and this might be just that the creditors trust people making more money more, or that they can make more money off of them, not meaning to be cynical about it, but in any case, if you're only making 20,000 a year, you're not going to be 50,000 in debt because no one will loan you the 30,000. But if you're making 100,000 a year, you could be 200,000 in debt because as your credit goes up, they're like, oh, wait, well, it's not so much that they trust you. It's just that they're thinking if you keep working, you'll keep paying. But all of that to say this, we're to have an excess. Debt robs us of the excess because the excess goes to interest. I think you've probably heard our country is paying 40 cents on every dollar. Our federal government, 40 cents on every dollar in interest. I would call that bad stewardship. But in any case, that's their problem, I guess, and ours since we elect them and keep electing them and keep electing them. But in any case, back to the issue at hand. All giving was to be in proportion to God's blessing and provision. But the next issue is, is really, well, it has to do with motivation. He said, I didn't want any collections at his arrival. Paul, no doubt, got this from Jesus. He taught about the importance of motivation in our giving, in our ministering, in our serving, in whatever we do. Because he's looking on the heart. He's concerned not just with what we do, but why we're doing it. And so... Paul is saying, I don't want you to take up a big collection when I'm there because Paul knew these are immature, carnal Christians and they're going to want him to know what they're giving. Now listen, this is kind of built in. It's in us, in all of us. 
Some of us are overcoming it. Some of us are fully, you know, overcome by it. But it's in all of us. And I'll give you an example. We were in Athens there at Mars Hill. I'm with my pastor, Pastor Chuck. And, and it's like I'm loving he's doing most of the teaching. Let me teach a couple times, which I really appreciated. I was doing a lot of worship for him. This is some years ago. Anyway, people wanted to climb Mars Hill and get up there. This is where the philosophers would speak and teach and discuss. And, and so people are trying to get up there. And it's a little steep and a little awkward. And so Pastor Chuck's over there helping him. And, and I immediately think, man, I should get over there and help too. So this is a good thing to do with a good motivation for doing it. So I go over and I'm helping people up. And somewhere in the middle of all this, I start thinking, this is so cool. Pastor Chuck's seeing me help these people. Like, listen, that's not why I started doing it. But, but somehow midstream, my motivation for what I was doing changed. It became carnal. It became immature. I became more interested in the fact that he was seeing me serve than the fact that God gave me opportunity to serve. And I'm thinking, if that can happen to me, not to say I'm so much more spiritual than you, but if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. And probably does. So if you would give more if people noticed and, and took notice, or you would work harder if someone was watching. Well, that's a motivational problem, see? And you don't, here's the other issue. When you catch yourself doing the right thing for the wrong reason, some are like, well, I might as well not do it. My motive's so messed up. No, that's not what you change. You still serve, you still minister, you still give. You just adjust the motivation. God, forgive me for being so foolish, for being so carnal, for thinking that it was more important that I be noticed than I be faithful. Well, here's the thing. Paul never taught that giving would put God in their debt. And, and this is the other issue, the why of giving. We've already seen it. It was because there was a need. And if we love God and we love people, we're going to want to meet the needs of people around us. And so here's the thing. There are some who teach today, as some taught in that day, that, you know, you can work God. You, it's a formula. It's a system. You, you do this and he does that. And, and there are all sorts of ways to express it. But let me just say, you can never put God in your debt. And here's why. Everything you have came from him. Oh, but I worked hard for it. He gave you the ability to work. Oh, yeah, but I worked harder than anyone else. He gave you the ability to do that. Yeah, but there's no but about it. It's like what we have, we have by the grace of God. The very fact that you can get up and get out of bed, if you don't believe that, well, there's only two ways to learn it. You can hear it and believe it, or you can experience it and believe it. I want to encourage you, hear it and believe it. Because you don't want to wake up tomorrow or next week and not even be able to move and say, okay, Lord, I get it. I can't even get out of bed. You know that, that passage where Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing? Yeah. Does anyone believe that? Oh, I can do all sorts of stuff. He's saying no. And so we need to realize that who we are, what we have, our potential, it's all him. It all comes from him. It should all be offered back to him. Our motivation for giving is God has graciously provided for us and he's given us opportunity to minister with our resources, our assets, our talents, our gifts, natural and spiritual, to love him by loving people, to love him by caring for the needy around us. For God so loved, he gave. And what did he give? His very best, his only begotten son. Well, again, the thing that excites me about this chapter is Paul affirms his belief then in spite of their immaturity, in spite of their carnality, in spite of their confusion and frustration, they would do the right thing. So he says in verse 5, Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey whenever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, if the Lord permits. What's Paul saying? In a nutshell, he's saying, look, I'm going to be passing through, but I don't want to just pass through. I don't want to just check in. I want to spend time. I want to fellowship with. I want to invest in you guys. So what's the key factor? If the Lord permits. Just as our Lord prayed, not my will, but yours be done, as he prayed to the Father, Paul's saying, look, here's what I'd like, here's what I'm planning, here's what I'm hoping, but in the end it will be whatever the Lord decides. And I hope you're deciding things the same way. And whatever you do, that, that you realize, hey, it's the Lord. 
He has to be on the throne of my life. He has to have the, the steering wheel, as it were, or I'm going to be headed the wrong direction. Well, he says, I'll tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Paul had been in Ephesus up to three years at this point. He had a very fruitful and effective ministry. In fact, he says in verse 9, a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, Jesus is the one who said he opens doors that no one can shut and shuts doors no one can open. And Paul's saying he found in Ephesus a very open door. But in the midst of the opportunity, there was great adversity. Why? Because the enemy of our souls works overtime on people who are fruitful for the Lord, who are faithful to the Lord, who are succeeding in what God's fashioned and formed us to do. And so... I think this is important. It'll come up again and again. And in fact, I think I mentioned, well, I don't know if I mentioned it last night. I know I mentioned it first service. When I went through the Old Testament for the first time with my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, he was teaching 10 chapters a night in the Old Testament. Now listen, he talks at about a third of the speed that I do. And, and, and so it wasn't a six-hour study. I'm still amazed that, I, I, that it, it happened, that I sat there and saw it happen. I've tried my best to get through the Old Testament at a quick pace so people can see the whole thing. You know, it took me 21 years to get through the Old Testament. J. Vernon McGee, five years. Pastor Chuck, four years. Me, 21 years. And I'm talking fast, so I don't even know how that happens. But I do know this. I asked him one time, my pastor, I'm like, what about all that stuff you pass over? What, what about the stuff? I mean, there was this and this, and you didn't touch on that and address that. What about that? And he's like, don't worry, it comes up again. I was young, you see, and I found that to be true, that sometimes we'll just touch on something here, and you're like, oh, I wish we would have really delved into that. Well, it's going to come up again, guaranteed. And there are times where it's the main subject, and we'll deal with it. There are times where this is more like a bunch of bullet points, where we're getting the big picture of what Paul wanted to see happen in the church at Corinth. Well, great and effective door was opened. Lots of people coming to the Lord. Lots of people growing in the Lord. A very loving and healthy fellowship there in Ephesus. The problem church was uh, there in Corinth. He's writing to them from Ephesus. He says, I'm going to be passing through. I want to come and spend some time with you. But I want you to know God is really blessing me here and the enemy is really opposing me here. Now, I've noticed the more fruitful we are, the greater the enemy's attacks. And it's important to know that that's going to happen because sometimes, though we've been forewarned, Jesus said, if they love me, they'll love you. If they hate me, they'll hate you. And so we can be in the midst of doing exactly what we know God's called us to do. We're motivated by love. We're ministering in love. Everything's as it should be. And all of a sudden, it's like all hell breaks loose, literally. And we're like, what in the world's happening here? Lord, I'm, I'm doing what you sent me to do. And why all these problems? Why all this opposition? It's because the enemy's real. Because it, he doesn't just say, oh, wow, look at that. What a bummer. People coming to Christ. People growing in Christ. People living for Christ. No, he opposes us at every juncture. There's a wonderful book called The Screwtape Letters. It's an older book, but so well written. That lays out a scenario that, that kind of gives you some possible scenes for behind the scenes. But in any case, if you get a chance to read it, Screw Tape Letter, C.S. Lewis, a great, great read. Well, as Paul discussed his future plans with the folks in Corinth, one phrase jumps out and should jump out to you as well, where it says, if the Lord permits. Now, as a contrast to the way Paul is proceeding, I cannot help but think of the characters in the book of Ruth, Elimelech, Naomi, and their two sons. I say contrast because they left Bethlehem, the house of bread, to go to Moab, God's wash pot, because of a famine in the land that was brought on because of the Israelites' disobedience. Now, had they waited on the Lord, I'm pretty certain that the Lord would have told them, no, that's not what I want you to do. Now, even though things ended up good in the end, that family suffered greatly before Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth were redeemed. Now, when it comes to the things Paul was planning and doing, it was absolutely critical that he sought the Lord's guidance and followed God's lead. May you and I begin to follow Paul's lead in our lives and say, if the Lord permits, when we start making our plans.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.